mode. Well, hello and welcome to today's Vermont Hops Power Hour webinar. My name is Deb Haliba and I work with the University of Vermont Extension Northwest Crops and Soils Program and am providing assistance for this webinar series. And so before we jump in, I just wanted to provide a quick, um, a few quick housekeeping reminders. First, we are grateful to the Northeast Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program, SARE, for funding support for this project. We are recording the webinar and will be providing the URL to the recording later this week. Um, as a reminder, our session is scheduled for 60 minutes and we'll have about 30 minutes of presentation time. We'll ask you to respond to two quick poll questions and then spend the remainder of our time together answering questions that you may have. Today we will be talking about potato leaf hopper in hops and I am really thrilled to introduce our featured speaker, Dr. Lily Calderwood with Cornell Cooperative Extension. Lily received her PhD from the University of Vermont Department of Plant and Soil Science where she studied integrated pest management in Northeast hops production. She's now a commercial horticulture educator with Cornell Extension's Capital Area Agriculture and Horticulture Program. Lily. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Deb. Uh, it's a mouthful of a program. <laughs> and <laughs> so, yes, we're going to talk about potato leaf hopper management, which is a timely topic. And this is a, the background on this slide is a sticky trap. If you are not familiar with those yet, maybe you should uh, look into those. But we can see some a lot of different insects on this sticky trap. There are potato leaf poppers, many of them, uh, but then there are also many flies and some parasitoid wasps that you might also see in your hop yard. So potato leaf hopper and Poasca fabii is a, a broad, a host with a broad host range. And the nymphs look like this. I don't know if you can see my mouse. Uh, the nymphs look like this, and they are they range in size from very small to larger. And as they get larger and larger, they finally become an adult. And this is an adult in the lower uh, picture. And this is the damage that we call hopper burn that they cause. Their life history, just to give you a sense of what this pest um, is all about, is that it is an economically damaging pest of alfalfa, potato, soybean, raspberry, maple trees, you name it. There are 200 species of broadleaf plant that this insect feeds on. And it prefers to feed on new growth. And if you have been out in your hop yard lately, hopefully you have looked for leafhoppers feeding on the new growth, which is the top part of the plant. And they have piercing sucking mouth parts, uh, which means that they feed in the phloem of the plant. So we have a xylem and we have a phloem in every plant. And the phloem is the vascular, is the part of the vascular system that transports carbohydrates, which are sugars, that are really nutritious to the potato leaf hopper. And this pest was documented as um, a pest on hops in the 1800s, um, but they don't uh, have any documentation of a management tactic for this pest. There are some reports that copper fungicide kept this pest at bay, but not to a point that was actually uh, reducing their damage. And in the Northeast, we have seen two to three generations per season of potato leaf hopper. And right now, I have seen the second generation starting to take off. And this pest has been seen to kill first-year hop plants and reduce photosynthesis in uh, mature plants. We have yearly population variation with this pest, which makes it very difficult to manage. And this list here, you can, you can see the last five years of the peak 
population of potato leaf hopper. So in 2012, there was a peak of in late June of potato leaf hopper, and then 2013 we see a June July steady population where there are a few peaks, but it, they were really a heavy population through those two months. And then in 2014, there was a very low population. They hardly had a presence. They had a very late arrival. So they weren't really a problem that year. But then the following year, in 2015, they did appear again in late June for another peak. And then 2016, there was a high population with a late June peak. So on average, it seems as though late June is when we see the peak population and therefore the damage. And the reason why there is such population variation is that they are overwintering in the southeast part of the United States. And uh, given the right conditions, they will be lifted up and carried to the Midwest first and then to the northeast on wind currents. So they are their movement is weather dependent. And they're, it's a combination of temperature and pressure that triggers this insect to be lifted up into the sky and start its journey north. Um, and it's not a pest in these southeastern states on the uh, crops that we would normally look for it on. So this is what potato leaf hopper looks like, um, the nymphs look like on the bottom of a leaf. And these are first and second instar nymphs. So that means these are very small. And I saw these the, just the other day in outside of Albany, New York. So further south from where Scott and Deb and Heather are in northern Vermont, but uh, closer to Massachusetts and Connecticut. So down here, the populations are starting to take off, but it depends on the location. And on this farm I was on, there was severe hopper burn on the top half of plants. So I would consider the top half of the plant to be new growth. And you can see in the picture on the right, the leaves from the middle of the plant upward are very curled and have severe hopper burn. And I'm just showing you this because I don't want you to confuse it with downy mildew, which we all have plenty of downy mildew in our hop yards, but this is hopper burn. It's not downy mildew. And so on the upper left corner, you can see curled leaves and you can see hopper burn where there are some yellow sections of the leaf that are followed by dark dying tissue. So we have chlorotic yellowing and then necrotic leaf death. And when this pest is feeding, it's feeding on the veins on the underside of the leaf. And it's sucking out the phloem. And as it does that, it constricts the phloem and then the xylem so that the leaf does not get the nutrients that it needs. And the plant starts to shut down photosynthesis. So hopper burn doesn't show up until five days after feeding, which is interesting. And it is an indicator that you need to go out into your hop yard earlier than today <laughs> to look for this pest. And it really is a key part to the management of this insect. Get out there early. And right now, our only control option is to spray. And we'll go through some alternatives, but the spray that is most effective is a pyrethroid, a product that has a pyrethrin as the active ingredient. Um, and it, it works, it does significantly reduce the number of potato leaf hoppers, but it comes with a risk. And that is a risk that you will have a secondary outbreak of two spotted spider mites later in the season. And as we have seen many times, many hop growers have used this type of product and uh, they get rid of the initial problem, which is the potato leaf hopper, but then later in this season, they have a bigger problem and an incredible yield loss from the spider mites 
the spider mites just dry out the cones. So we we say this is the most effective spray and the only real guarantee that you're going to get rid of this insect, but it causes more it may cause more harm than good. And as of now, there is not an economic threshold for patchouli leaf hopper. Um, we're working on trying to get this type of project funded, so maybe we'll get to that point in the future. Um, but right now, our current recommendation is to shake the plants, and if you have a potato leaf hopper adult fly out, then it's time to take some action. You can also scout by looking at the undersides of leaves, which is where the nymphs and the adults hang out. You'll see the adult fly away, and um, if you're not able to catch that adult flying away, you may not see any nymphs yet, but that's because you've got a lag in the generation time, and eventually the nymphs will show up. So I recommend continuing to look at your plants. Now, there are other OMRI-approved ingredients, uh, pesticide ingredients, that may work for you. Now, these are products that are, you know, they're being used by organic potato growers in the Northeast, and these are comments from other growers. I have not tested them. I don't think anyone else has for potato leaf hopper on hops, but these are labeled OMRI approved, and they are labeled for leaf hoppers. So azadiractin is an active ingredient that prevents molting, so prevents the insect from going from the first instar to the next instar to the next to the next. It stops its development into an adult. And then one other grower mentioned that grape growers in Michigan are using 1% stylet oil. So if you already are using this for grapes or apples, you may consider it, but be warned that it may burn your leaves. And then another comment is that if you use Pyganic, which is the pyrethroid that is labeled uh, for organic production, um, you would want to use it with a spreader sticker so that uh, the product sticks to the underside of the leaves. And it is difficult to get good spray coverage, whether you're applying a fungicide or an insecticide. You want to make sure that it sticks to leaves, so you're using less product. You want that product you put on to stay there for a few days, even if it does rain. And we also want to get it on the underside of the leaf so that it kills the insect that's there. Um, we don't want to over-apply an insecticide more times than we need to. Okay, so yes, you can try releasing biocontrols. This is a bag of ladybugs that you can order, and you can get a bag of these, and you can try to release them, uh, but good luck because they'll probably fly away. These ladybugs and other generalist predators that you can buy uh, work very well in a greenhouse. They work very well in a high tunnel, but they don't work as well in the field, uh, but I don't want to tell you not to try it. Um, I would recommend planting some uh, flowering plants like yarrow or alyssum in your hop yard just on the corners of the hop yard among the landscape so that those provide food and habitat for natural enemy biocontrol insects that would feed on these pest insects. But unfortunately, the potato leaf hopper does not have a lot of natural enemies that are specific to it. Uh, if you do order these, you want to make sure you squirt them with water once they arrive and keep them in the fridge and release them in the evening. Okay, now we have done quite a bit of research into potato leaf hopper management and alternatives to spraying. The first one is, that I'll talk about is trap cropping. And the second one is plant defense, both physical and chemical defense. So in other crops, we, we do learn things from other crops. 
And the first one is that in soybean, potato leaf hoppers have passed on soybean. And in the Midwest, they are intercropping soybean with winter wheat, which seems to reduce the attraction to soybean, uh, reduce potato leaf hoppers' attraction to soybean. And that's really because this is winter wheat. And winter wheat is planted in between the soybean rows in the fall. The soybean isn't there yet. They're planting winter wheat in the fall. It comes up very early in the spring. And if the wheat is present in the field before the soybeans are present in the field, the leafhopper will not land in the grass species in the wheat, and it will not feed in that field. Um, it may show up later, but by the time it's later and the leafhoppers may migrate from another field to this field, the wheat is taller, and they still probably will not want to feed in this field. And the second thing that um, is used are resistant varieties. So this is an example of plant defense. Resistant alfalfa varieties have very hairy leaves. And they, you can, excuse me, you can see on the left side there are susceptible alfalfa, there is an susceptible alfalfa variety. And then on the right, there's a resistant variety. The resistant variety has a lot of leaf, uh, leaf hairs, which we also call trichomes. Now, I'll go into our research on trap cropping. So we did a flowering ground cover, cover cropping study in Alberg, and this compared different drive row ground covers that were let to flower. So we compared mowed grass to a red clover treatment, and that was also compared to a mixed diverse treatment that was yarrow, clover, and bee balm. And what we found is that in years with a high po population of potato leaf hopper, and when there was a well-established stand of clover, the potato leaf hoppers preferred to feed in the red clover over the hot plants. So they preferred to feed in the clover. That was a 10 by 30 foot block planted between hop rows over feeding on hot plants. And they preferred to feed on hot plants over feeding in this diverse mix, which we would call a polyculture. And this phenomenon is seen in other crops. So potato leaf hopper prefers to feed in a full stand of alfalfa, a, a monoculture of alfalfa. And I'm sure you've seen this phenomenon. <laughs> I wish I could see the hand, uh, show of hands. When you have an alfalfa field near your hop yard. Um, it's cut for hay, and the leaf hopper, once it's cut, the leaf hoppers fly right over to the hop yard. And so it is so obvious that the leaf hoppers prefer to feed in a full stand of monoculture alfalfa. Um, and so what they found to manage the population in alfalfa was to add grass to it. And so in this polyculture alfalfa, there's alfalfa and grass, and the potato leaf hoppers do not feed as much in that mixed stand. Now, this brings up a question of whether we could tra uh, trap crop. Could we create a trap crop for potato leaf hopper where we, ha we plant a section of vegetation, whether it's alfalfa or clover, or another legume or potato, something that the leafhoppers really love to eat. If we planted a big section of that plant, would we attract leafhoppers to that space and would that pull them away from the hot plant? Would they prefer to feed over there and leave our hot plants alone? Well, so there are some uh, farmers who are interested in looking into this. One of them is Forrester Farms in Northfield, Massachusetts. And they're in their second year of a SARE farmer grant. 
where they are attempting to answer some of these questions relating to a trap crop. Um, so one of their questions is how big would a legume stand need to be to be attractive to the leafhopper over hops? How far into the hop yard would the alfalfa pull the PLH away from hops? And do the leafhoppers need to be removed from the trap crop at a certain density? So the leafhoppers could become so numerous in the trap crop that they overflow into the hop yard. So we wouldn't want that to happen. Uh, so one idea would be to spray the trap crop rather than your hop plants. <laughs> so there are many questions we have to uh, answer here. So this is a picture of their hop yard and how the trap crop is set up. It's on the end of end of each hop yard, and you can see we put in a control and an alfalfa sprayed treatment and an alfalfa no spray treatment. So the alfalfa sprayed treatment would be sprayed at the alfalfa potato leaf hopper economic threshold, whereas the alfalfa no spray would not be sprayed at all. So there are, uh, each trap crop plot is 4,000 square feet. So they're pretty big, but not that big in comparison to the whole hop yard. And we placed sticky cards in the alfalfa treatments, but also going into the hop yard at different uh, spacing. So there's a card. 25 feet in, then there's another card 50 feet in, then there's another one at 400 feet in. And they replicated this four times. Now, I, the <laughs> biggest uh, learning experience from this was that the on their farm, there's a vegetable farmer who they uh, share land with, so they need to rotate their fields, and they rotate with the vegetable farmer. And so it just so happened that in 2016, there's a 20, more than a 20 acre potato field right next to this trap crop and right next to their hop yard, which potato, okay, the potato leaf hopper definitely likes potato also. <laughs> so this potato field served as a huge trap crop and on July 1st last year, so they're going along, they're collecting all their sticky traps every week and not seeing too many leaf hoppers, like one or two, then probably 10 per card, which is pretty low every week. I'm just going along and then July 1st comes along. And what does the vegetable farmer do? Well, he's managing his potatoes and of course there are leaf hoppers in the potato field. So he sprays the potato field right next to the hop yard and all the leaf hoppers come flying over to the hop yard in a big way. And I'm just going to illustrate this by showing you this graph or uh, map. This is a map of their hop yard and every red circle is the average number of potato leaf hoppers per plant in that location. So you see they're, they're pretty low numbers. And then when we add this July 1st date into the data, we see a really large increase in the number of potato leaf hoppers per plant. And it's because they sprayed the potatoes and all the leaf hoppers <clears throat> came right over into the hop yard. So the week before, on June 20th, there was a mean number of four potato leaf hoppers per trap. And on July 1st, there was a mean number of 75 leaf hoppers per trap which is insane. So the, this, in, from my perspective, the Latoiles will give you their perspective, which is excellent and so valuable to hear it from the farmer. They're there every day. But in my opinion so far, the surrounding habitat is so influential on potato leaf hopper. And it's just going to be really hard to manage potato leaf hopper using a small trap crop 
you would need a 50 acre trap crop to really manage this pest and no farmer is going to sacrifice <laughs> that much land to not be mowed. So this is just another example. This is another farm over here in eastern New York with plenty of hopper burn as you can see on these leaves and along the edge of this hop yard is a big meadow and so that's a meadow that hasn't been mowed yet but they still have a lot of potato leaf hopper. And then this is a farm that doesn't have many leaf hoppers. It's on top of a hill and it's surrounded by a diverse meadow. And so, you know, it really just depends on your location. And it, what I have learned, maybe I've just become jaded about <laughs> the whole thing, <laughs> but I think that we need, we have more work to do and a trap crop is probably not the answer on how we can really manage a large population of potato leaf hoppers. Now the second uh, concept, the second line of defense would be plant defense. So plants have chemical and physical defenses. If you think of a rose plant, a rose has thorns and those are a physical defense against insects, against other predators, against us. <laughs> um, and then a chemical defense is um, usually a complex combination of chemical compounds that are secreted through different plant parts to either attract certain insects or repel others. And have you noticed that potato leaf hopper prefers some cultivars over others? I certainly have. And within a hop yard, you will probably notice this. So way back in 2012 and 2013, we uh, really paid attention to which varieties the leafhoppers were most present on. So this is a graph with the, on the left, or we'll, well, we see the mean number of potato leafhoppers per plot per leaf by cultivar. And you can see Horizon, Cluster, Teamaker, Mount Rainier really don't have many potato leafhoppers per leaf, but other varieties such as Liberty, Fuggle, Mount Hood, Tetning, Santiam, Newport, always have significantly more potato leaf hoppers per leaf. So why could this be? Well, it turns out that hop plants have leaf hairs on their leaves. There are two different types of leaf, ha leaf hairs on the leaves. Uh, the arrow on the left is pointing to a lupulin gland. And the lupian glands are present on the leaves. They're also present on the cone, in the cones. So hop cones, were, we are harvesting hop cones because of these lupian glands. But there are just fewer of them on the leaves. There are um, many more in the cones, which is why we're harvesting the cones rather than the leaves. But they are present on the hop leaves. And they're present there as a defense. There's chemistry in that little round ball. And um, then we also have this other type of leaf hair, which looks more like a hair. It's called a bulbous trichome. So we have these, these um, things on the leaves that are plant defenses. And these are two different varieties. We have Liberty on the left, Centennial on the right. These are uh, blown up pictures of the underside of the leaves. And we, I did a lot of counting of these leaf hairs. <laughs> Why not count leaf hairs? But yeah, so we saw that there are more leaf hoppers on the leaves of the plants that had less lupulin glands than there were on the leaves that had more lupulin glands. So it seems as though the leafhopper is repelled by some chemistry in the lupulin glands. And so in alfalfa, I mentioned that there are these varieties that are resistant to potato leafhopper for alfalfa. And so the, the picture on the left is a smooth stem 
with hardly any leaf hairs on it, and that's a standard alfalfa cultivar which would be susceptible to potato leaf hopper. Whereas on the right, we have a picture with hairs, lots of hairs and lots of chemistry in there. That's a, an alfalfa variety that is resistant to potato leaf hopper. So we are currently in search of the hairiest hop, and if you find it, you know, please let somebody know. <laughs> uh, but these hairs are microscopic. They are, they are very small. You can see the lupulin glands with a good eye, uh, without a microscope, or with a hand lens, you can also see them. So if you uh, have a especially hairy hop, maybe it can be uh, donated to Heather's new variety trial. But that's kind of where we are with potato leaf hopper management, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Oh, I added in a picture of a hop looper. Not the topic of this webinar, <laughs> but I found one, and so I wanted to show you what it looked like. You can see there are two white stripes on this caterpillar, and if you could see the pro legs, you would see that there are four pro legs, so those are the uh, defining features of the hop looper. Okay, thank you very much. This was a fun thing to do. Thank you so much, Lily, and I'll look forward to finding a hairy hop and want to hear more about hop loopers. But before we do that, um, why don't we go over to our quick polls, and folks who have been on this webinar series before are familiar. So we're just going to open up this poll, and if you could respond to, click on one of those responses, that would be great. So did you learn anything new today? If you could click on one of those responses, that would be great. Excellent. All righty. And we have one more for you today. Here we go. Based on what you learned today, will you change or start a pest management practice? If you could just click on one of those responses, that would be wonderful. And then we'll open up the mic for uh, Q&A. Great. Excellent. Thank you. So as a reminder for now, um, to pose a question, you're just going to type it into the question box. It's on your control panel. If for some reason that's closed, you can look at the bottom of your screen. There should be a little uh, blue or yellow icon. It looks like a flower. That's the go-to webinar icon. And that'll just open up your control panel, and you should see the question box right on the, the right-hand side of your screen, usually. If you're on a mobile device, you'll just click on the question mark. And you'll just type in your question, and I will ask those to Lily. And Lily, we have one question in the queue right now. Um, it's about Stylet Oil versus uh, Sticker Spreader for Pyganic. So can you just talk about the those two different products? Sure. So a Sticker Spreader is something that... Um, can be mixed with most products. And uh, you do want to look on the pesticide label that you're using to make sure that it's OK to use the sticker spreader. Um, but I would have to look on the label. But I do not think that it is recommended to mix the stylet oil with Pyganic. But um, let me look. I know. Uh, so on the Vermont Veg and Berry listserv, they had this whole conversation about potato leaf hopper management in potato, and I found it quite interesting uh, from a hop perspective. Let's see. So people were talking about mixing Paganic with Surround, which is a clay-based product, and they're talking about mixing Paganic with spreader sticker and the consensus from this group not from uh, my research experience but from this farmer conversation is that the spreader sticker was more effective however the spreader sticker may reduce the effect of a copper fungicide okay Thank you. Um, so if I see potato leaf hopper on a particular variety in my hop yard, should I only spray that variety or should I spray the whole hop yard? 
you should spray the whole hop yard. Unfortunately, so since they do have this preference from one variety to the other, they will just jump from one variety to the other as well. So given an option, they will prefer to feed on one variety. But if you make that variety unappetizing, they will just jump to the next one. Okay. Um, we have several questions here in the queue about um, beneficials. So first one, what's the best way to spread lacewing larvae? larvae? <laughs> um, so the way I've seen them come is in a box, a little cardboard box, and they come so that each individual larva are in, is in its own container, its own um, little box. And that's because they're very predator, they're very predacious, and they will eat each other if you let them uh, cohabitate. So I would recommend taking the cover off of the container that it comes in, and then you just gently shake shake and move along the row or um, the section that you are putting them in. Don't worry if you put two down in one place, that's okay. But I would uh, shake them gently onto the vegetation and just keep moving along down the row. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Um, what about this? Um, I have a beneficials garden, but it is uh, about 20 by 20 in one location. That's 20 feet by 20 feet. Um, should it be placed in several areas around the hop yard for more habitat locations? Um, I think a 20 by 20 is pretty good, um, depending on how far away it is from the hop plants. But that habitat will provide several natural enemies to the hop yard. I do think that if you could plant a few plants on the other side of the hop yard, that would definitely help. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's adjacent to the hop yard. Okay, yeah. So it, it's definitely, it's helping on that one side, and I'm sure the natural enemies are trickling over to the other side of the hop yard, but I would plant some yarrow or alyssum, just a small amount of it on the other side as well. The other thing to consider when you're um, working with habitat management, when you're trying to incorporate extra vegetation into a hop yard, you have to consider moisture management for your downy mildew issues because the more vegetation you add to a hop yard, the more moisture you're going to trap. And if you do not mow at all, you're going to have a terrible problem with downy mildew. And you're also going to give the pest habitat too. So there's a real balance between providing natural enemy habitat and reducing moisture. So I would I would use strips of habitat in between rows, but mow between I would I would um, organize your hop yard like hop yard, mow the grass, and then a flower row, and then mow again, and then your next hop yard hop row starts. That makes sense. So smaller, more frequent patches of flowers with mode space in between would be best. And I know you did some research on this, um, Lily, but would you say that yarrow and alyssum is better than, say, wild parsnip and dogbane? Do you know about varietals? Mm, uh, good question. I would say that the, the native cultivar would be your best choice, um, but when you are choosing which uh, cultivars of flowers to plant, I would recommend choosing one that will produce nectar. So the more flowers, the better, uh, which is why alyssum works so well. Just plain white alyssum and common yarrow are um, good choices because there are a lot of flowers per plant. Gotcha. How about, um, do you have thoughts about red clover within the rows? Um, so we all learn a lot. I have learned a lot about red clover. And it is a great plant. It will attract a lot of uh, pollinators, which 
are an ecosystem service, but not necessarily necessary for hop production as they are wind pollinated. But the red clover is an interesting plant. It will uh, provide some habitat for the natural enemies, so it is a good choice. It's also a cheaper seed, which is great and easy to plant. It comes up in the spring and it's a biennial, so that, that means you don't have to plant it every year. Um, people often ask about nitrogen and clovers in the hop yard, and in order to get nitrogen from the clover to hops, you would have to incorporate the clover and then really push that soil over to the hop plant. So you would be hilling that clover to the hop plant which is a possibility, and they do do this in Europe. If you plant an early cover crop of red clover, got it going, and then incorporated it, and then hilled your hop rows, you're tilling your hop row, and you're pushing the soil up onto the hop row, that, that is one possibility, but then you no longer have the natural enemy habitat for the, from the clover. So it depends what you would like to use the clover for. Okay, fair enough. Um, so in order to introduce predators for two-spotted um, spider mite, when would you recommend ceasing pyganic applications? Never use it. That's the problem. <laughs> if you use it once, you're going to knock out the entire um, assemblage of predators. Uh, unfortunately. And it just takes a long time for those to build back up to a level where they could manage the spider mite population. But if you are able to, if you have to spray for the leafhoppers, if you can time it so that you're out there early and you only have to spray once or twice with the Paganic or as a guard, then, so that I should mention, the Pyganic is much more lethal to the natural enemies than Azadiractin. Azadiractin is a softer product for the natural enemies. So if you can, I would try the Azadiractin. You may have to apply it a few times, though, to get the leaf hoppers under control. Okay, how about, can you mix Pyganic with a sticker, a spreader sticker and Rampage? I don't know. You ha would have to look that up. Okay. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. Um, how about, um, does white oil, which is vegetable oil and Murphy's oil soap mixture, have any effect on controlling potato leafhopper? Hmm. Um, soaps are okay, but in general, I would not say they would work very well with the potato leafhopper. They can, the soaps seem to work better for the aphids on a, many different crops. Um, but also, you should be careful with the soap because it can burn the plant, especially new growth. And neem, neem is uh, neem oil does not work very well for potato leaf poppers, but it, I believe uh, UVM saw it to work fairly well for spider mites last year. So if you're able to just spray once or twice for the potato leaf hopper, then not spray any insecticide again, and you have your natural enemy habitat plantings around in your hop yard, then you may be able to release some lace wings, great idea, L release some predatory mites, and then hopefully your natural enemy population will build back up and if you start to see some spider mite destroyers, that is excellent. Unfortunately, you can't buy them, but that's a, that's a predator that's really going to help you manage the spider mites. And then the neem oil is softer on the natural enemies, so if you do start to have a spider mite problem, you may consider using that. Okay, this person says Magister SC was just approved for leafhopper on hops. Any, do you have any experience with that product? I don't have experience with that product. What, what is the active ingredient? Let's see if they 
If you can type in the active ingredient of Magister SC, that would be great. We'll just have a little time. Let's see. While they're typing that in, uh, just an FYI about the clover. They use the clover as a preferred host to potato leaf hopper. Mm -hmm. And appreciate your reply on the spacing of beneficial plants within the hop yard. Hmm. Not quite sure about the Magister SC. And let me just see if we have any other question. Any other questions that folks have for Lily? I think we've answered everything in the queue here. Just going through. I think that was all the questions, Lily. Okay, good. Um, I just looked up this Magister SC, and I'm not familiar with this active ingredient, if it is labeled for leaf hoppers, then you may be able to do that, but you would want to make sure that it's also labeled for hops in your state. So the insecticide label is the key. Um, and then if you're a conventional grower, bifenthrin, or no, bifenthrin, B-I-F, Bifenthrin is a product that has been very effective. It's also uh, in the pyrethroid family. Can you say that three times fast? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, any other questions for Lily? Okay. Um, I think Scott had a few words that he wanted to share. Scott, are you... Here we go. I am here, yes. Thank you. So we have had a, a number of rounds of our Go Scout um, surveys gone out to you guys, and thank you for everyone who has um, participated in those. <clears throat> Excuse me. And as a, a, the final question on all of our surveys uh, that go out uh, is to ask if you guys have questions um, that that you need help answering. And so I'd like to take this last 10 minutes or so uh, to address those questions and any other questions uh, that, that might come up. Um, the first question uh, that was asked is if we have a crystal ball um, that we can rent out um, and unfortunately, no, we don't have any extras um, laying around. So I'm sorry about that. Um, there was a couple of questions about downy mildew, and we covered that uh, a few uh, months ago with David Gent, and I just want to revisit. So um, there was a question about uh, someone contemplating removing uh, varieties uh, and replacing them with less susceptible uh, varieties to downy. And certainly, if you um, are in an area um, where it's particularly like it, there's not a lot of wind, uh, you've got a lot of standing um, water nearby, conditions are, are conducive to downy mildew, certainly you'd want to consider varieties that are less susceptible. Um, but you're, the reality is, at least in the Northeast, we have found that you're not going to avoid downy mildew. Um, so we're just, you know, developing ways to, to manage it as we're finding the most um, the most feasible. Um, so again, um, you could certainly consider sticking with varieties that are less susceptible, um, but but certainly do not tear up your yard uh, in search of the um, the variety that is going to avoid downy problems altogether. Because again, not in the Northeast, unfortunately. Um, another question is, how do you stop it from spreading? Uh, that is downy mildew. And again. You know, we are living with downy in the northeast, and so um, unfortunately, there's no way to stop it from spreading. Um, really, it's just the, the strategies that um, that David Gent had talked about and that we've talked about um, over the years in managing it. Again, you're not going to be able to stop it altogether, um, unfortunately. Um, and so... Um, 
I'd like to move on to some of the other pest questions that have come up beyond just potato leafhopper. Um, Lily did a great job of, of giving us um, some insight into, into managing potato leafhopper, which is one of those first, generally one of the first uh, pests to show up uh, each year, but there are others. Uh, so one person uh, had asked about strategies not only for dealing with potato leafhoppers, uh, but with dealing with caterpillars. Um, there are a few caterpillars that show up um, year after year uh, in our hop yards in the Northeast. Um, as Lily mentioned, the hop looper, um, little green caterpillar, it's got those white racing stripes on the side. Um, we've seen some of those up here in Alberg. Um, and what I tell folks is, you know, they show up year after year. Um, they seem to do a little bit of damage defoliating those leaves uh, in your yard, but they don't seem to affect yield. Um, and so I really would just avoid taking any sort of action in dealing with, uh, excuse me, with hop loopers. Um, they, they just, they don't seem to do any economic damage. Um, just a little bit of uh, defoliation is, is fine. Um, we also, on occasion, uh, will see um, the hop merchant. Um, this is sort of a menacing looking caterpillar um, with what looks like spikes all over its body. Um, and again, just like the hop looper, um, those hop merchants really are not doing any damage uh, to your bottom line. Um, they may chew up the leaves a little bit, um, but lacy leaves um, still pr produce um, beautiful cones. Um, so again, um, those are the, the two biggest, uh, not biggest in terms of size, but um, caterpillars that show up um, uh, most frequently. And really there's nothing uh, other than just admiring them uh, that, that we recommend um, doing. Excuse me, I'm flipping through your, your questions now. Um, some folks had asked about beneficials, and I know Lily um, discussed a bunch of different beneficials um, that, that um, are out there, um, those that you can encourage um, through plantings, as well as um, those that you can purchase, um, ladybugs, lacewings. Um, I am starting to more and more see um, spider mite destroyers available um, online. Uh, we have not tested it and I tend to shy away from releasing beneficials because as Lily mentioned, um, they, there's nothing from stopping them from flying away or crawling away. Um, they're much more useful in enclosed environments like greenhouses. Um, although there were some growers up in Quebec um, that are swearing by releasing um, spider mite destroyers and also predatory mites. Um, so uh, again, things that are less likely to move away, less mobile beneficials, um, you're gonna have more success with. All right, flipping through some more of your questions. Um, um, mite control, again, dealing with two-spotted two spider mites. Um, there are a variety of conventional options, um, particularly those that attack the mite eggs, because uh, there are very few um, mites. There are some predatory mites out there, but there are very few mites that are beneficial. And so something that is very specific to mites and won't hurt other ins uh, won't hurt insects. Um, so the ovicides um, are really popular uh, to control um, two-spotted spider mite. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of an organic uh, control, Lily mentioned uh, neem oil. Uh, the product that we use up in Alberg is Trilogy. Uh, it's actually um, labeled for mite control, insect control, and also uh, it's a fungicide. Um, that you can use uh, for downy management, and so that's one of the reasons why we've rotated that through. Um, we have had some success, and there are other growers that, that have had success with that, that neem oil product. Again, it's called Trilogy. Um, let's see. Um, switching over to weeds. Uh, there was a question about help with weeds, and, um, you know, as an entomologist, I like to... Um, think that insects are the biggest problem, but the reality is that we, you know, weed control is really, really a challenging um, issue in hop yards, uh, particularly in the Northeast with all of our moisture. So I, I don't, um, I don't have an answer for you. Um, there is no silver bullet uh, when it comes to weed control. Um, 
There is a question about um, does anyone have experience crowning uh, in the spring with flame? Uh, I just saw that question pop up and I do want to mention that we have a trial running right now um, looking at um, using uh, actually a custom built uh, um, beautiful flame weeder for crowning um, and you know again this is very preliminary but it, it does not seem like um, the flame crowning um, is is any better um, and in fact might even be worse um, in terms of downy uh, it certainly uh, is helpful for weed control can I mention with the crowning I've had I've met a few growers over here who have crowned too hard and they just went too deep with the mechanical method and their hops really either did not come up at all or they're really behind. So just just go light. <laughs> Thank you, Lily, for for that piece. Yeah, it's we're we're really having uh, some difficulty figuring out what the best method is, and so um, there is a, a section I just wanted to put a plug out uh, on our Go Scout surveys. Um, if you are having success uh, dealing with any of issue, any of the issues that we're talking about, please share those with us, and then we can uh, we can get them out to the to the uh, larger audience um, on that. I was hoping so this is Heather, Heather too. Thank you, Heather. Oh, I'm yeah. I was gonna add about the crowning. Um, yeah, the being able to gauge the depth is really important and we noticed this year with a new mechanical crowner that we had, um, that if you have sort of an uneven hop yard like we do where we have mulch that's really high in one spot and not in another, that it tended you know, the crown tends to crown at different depths just because of that. Um, and so we're trying to figure out a way to kind of hold the crowner at a constant depth. Heather, there are a few questions that have come up about fertility. And I'd, while I yep. have you, I'd love to, to ask you. So one, one of our participants um, asked about the... Um, Hold on. The, the relative benefit of um, a soil test versus a petiole test. And can you just mm -hmm. briefly um, talk about the benefits to those two? Can you hear me okay, first of yes. all? Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah, so um, the soil test, you know, it measures what's available in the soil. It doesn't necessarily always um, reflect what... Uh, reflect what the plants would have access to but it certainly doesn't reflect you know what then could be lost through weather events you know as an example we've had a lot of rain this year um, so leaching especially of potassium might occur and of course nitrogen so um, a standard soil test really does the best at measuring you know potassium phosphorus pH lime those kind of things um, but what a, peti what a petiole test would do better with is measuring nitrogen. Nitrogen is a dynamic nutrient that needs to be captured in time. Um, and, and the benefit would really be for using a petiole for nitrogen analysis. Wonderful. Now, I, one last thing with that said is that we don't have a lot of data on um, what, you know, when you're interpreting a test, field test, we don't have a lot of data to support what's a really high level and what's a really low level. So, you know, what we're using is, is different um, numbers affected primarily through the Pacific Northwest. So that's the best information we have at this time uh, for using that particular test. Okay, done. <laughs> Could you, very briefly, because we only have about a minute, um, help to understand, uh, or help our growers to understand the, the use of liquid or dissolvable fertilizers as far as a nutrient credit? 
Um, I'm not sure if I fully understand that question, but if you're going to use a uh, synthetic fertilizer that's considered 100% available, so urea would be one, triple 19 would be another, um, those essentially are, we would consider all of the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium readily available to the plant. So unlike uh, organic material that breaks down more slowly. So whether that's dissolved in water or applied granularly, it's all considered available to the plant. Uh, what would be different about adding it in water would be that if you're fertigating with it, it would be direct right to the root system. Um, you'd be putting on smaller amounts at one time, and we would assume that the actual potential loss you know, to leaching or volatilization would be much lower. So the efficiency of the fertilizer would be better um, in, you know, going through a, a drip through fertigation. Oh. Hello? Hi. Um Okay, I think we're at time, so I think we should um, close this webinar down. But before we do, I wanted to make sure that folks know um, we have lots of resources on our website. So go to go.uvm.edu slash hops to find our website. And then a preview for next time. Um, our next webinar um, will be on July 31st um, at noon Eastern time. And we've invited uh, Andrew Landers from Cornell University. He's going to be talking about pesticide application tools and technology. So we hope you will join us then. Um, thank you so much, Scott and Heather, and especially to Lily for all of that great information you shared today. We really, really appreciate it. And with that, we will see you next time. Have a good week. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.